Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the Pillars of Eternity of Extreme Metal Podcasts. As always, I am the Death Metal Guy, aka indie rock band named Nazgul, ruining your search results for the rest of your natural life. Damn, that's the best one you've had in a long time. <laughs> you like that one? Yeah. It's happened It's <laughs> happened before, like not with Nazgul, but with, with some other band. It's happened and it fucked me up for a while. Wow. Um... Well, I am the black metal guy, a.k.a. Turbulent Nether Flux of Reviling Orchids. Are you just doing old school, like, uh, Dark Legion's Archive review names? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Cryptic matrices of furtive dissonance, you know? (laughs) I just haven't had anything, um, I, uh, cryptic merch, yeah, 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 I, um... Yeah, I, when I have something particularly metal to report, I'll, I'll use it. So, I gotcha. So. All right, episode uh, episode sixty six. Uh, this is where a bunch of people would make a big deal about it, but we're uh, we're we're bigger than that. You know, we're still missing a digit. Check back in ten years when we get to the important one. Um, <laughs> Uh, Terminus co-prosperity sphere, not within the sphere, but it's every once in a while, uh, these days it feels like, uh, release dates are the most unreliable thing on the planet. Uh, and, uh, I've had an EP by a Japanese sludge doom band on my spreadsheet for like two weeks now, uh, and it still hasn't come out. Um, so I figured, well, well, here's the opportunity to promo this band. No idea when this will ever come out, but I figured, Dude. you know... Japanese bands just don't give a fuck. They they're not confined by our Western constructs of release date. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or the Come idea to... that the release has to be like synchronous, like a release a release date or time can occur at many temporal instances. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're they're it, operating in the fourth dimension, dude. <laughs> they've they've like released it to a record store in like Kyoto. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so these guys are called Abiuro. Uh, the EP is called The Origin of Hyper Doom. Uh, and they've released a single off of it called Wounded Land. And uh, I just wanted to play this because it sounds like uh, one of our favorite forgotten Japanese sludge doom bands called Grudge. <laughs> so uh, let's just listen to the first couple minutes and uh, let's see what you make of it. I just wanted to bring this on because I like the idea that there is a thread of Japanese sludge doom that goes beyond, you know, just what everyone knows, which is corrupted. Um, 
you know, it, it's interesting. There's, oh, there's got to be the this. Show now? Yeah. Oh, all right, cool. <laughs> Uh, I just kept listening. Oh, that was that was sick. I kept watching the video. Um, I'll tell you about the video in a minute. Um, <laughs> yeah, what do you what do you think of that? Well, let me. Let, I just want to tell you guys. Just after the two minute mark, there's a really sick breakdown um, uh, with some excellent yeah, vocals. Um, but um, so the the so the video, like, holy shit, right? So uh, it's difficult. Everyone, I'm not even going to, like, why should we even talk about it? Everyone needs to go watch this video. It will restore your faith in humanity. Um, <laughs> it's it, it's anyway, a lot of fun. As you were, Death Metal Guy. Well, yeah, no, I was just uh, saying while you were still listening, it, it's cool to imagine that there is this thread of Japanese sludge doom beyond corrupted, um, which is the one everyone knows, um, but that other guys seem to be carrying forward but uh, the thing that this struck me as was grudge you know a, a band that both yeah. of us like from back in the day yes uh grudge is i remember there was some um the vocals are like the vocals this is somewhat similar some of these vocals are somewhat similar to the grudge vocals yeah but but grudge also had that like drunk owl hooting <laughs> I was gonna say, yes, yes, the hoot, the terrible hoot. Um, the hoot was so good. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's literally what grudge vocals sound like. We're, we're not fucking around, that? guys. I've never attempted to imitate that specific. Thank you, grudge. You inspired me. Um, or thank you, Aviuro video, really. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is a horrid, hollow hooting, which, once you hear it, is strangely intuitive as an extreme metal vocal. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it could very, only come from the Japanese metal punk it's, guys. It's, it's you know? basically like an ex it's an extreme version, hollowed out, deathly version of the, uh, of you know a crust punk, uh, you know, sort of like guttural vocal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's like the um, napalm death, like you know, the, kind of. But thing. with all the all the all the like guttural power kind of sapped out of it, so mm -hmm, all you have mm -hmm. is just like the hollow vocal hoot. sound. Yeah, just the hoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, very haunting. But the music it's and the music has this sort of um, grudge throws in like uh, faster punk beat type stuff and blasts, but. Um, the guitar tone is again similar. Yeah, that like crump, like an an HM two that's not working all the way. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, this is like, I mean, I wish they would release the record. Yeah, was... yeah, I, I fucking wish they would. It's like <laughs> the, the release date was like fucking a month ago, so I don't know what's going on. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe one day we will revisit Abiro. Um. But uh, real quick, uh, before we get to our rundown for today, we got a big episode for you guys. Uh, social media, obviously me, the death metal guy, on Facebook, at Terminus Podcast, and the black metal guy on Instagram, at Terminus Extreme Metal. And additionally, uh, if you want to get really invested, you can support us on Patreon or Subscribestar. $3 and up gets you access to uh, all of our Terminus Prime bonus episodes, and we have exciting developments for that coming up. We have a, a sort of roadmap to future episodes that you guys will be able to check out. What, what was the phrase? Roadmap to victory? <laughs> yeah, roadmap to victory. I, uh... Was that for Afghanistan? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got there. It only took twenty years, um, <laughs> and so it will to do all these all these Terminus Prime episodes, probably. But yes, we have a uh, a sort of list coming on, and we've got a uh, we've got ideas for how to maybe incorporate that into uh, patron tiers, that sort of thing in the future. But it's, we're going to make it public so you guys can, you know, you know wet your lips in anticipation for the kind of things we're going to be covering. Um. And five dollars and up, but before I forget, it's the access to the Terminus Black Circle, where you get to see things like this roadmap in development in public, and uh, get to drunkenly voice chat with uh, with uh, me and various buddies as they threaten to eat my cats for yelling too much during the podcast. <laughs> it's probably worth. I mean, we might as well at least say that the uh, the roadmap was basically made or originated by a fan. 
Um, yeah, yeah, a uh, so. a patron of ours who has done incredible meme work. The actually the inventor of Sword Boy Summer uh, yeah. has constructed a sort of roadmap of future Terminus episodes. It wasn't originally intended to be that, but it was so good we were like, oh well, here we go. Here's all of our ideas for the next three years. <laughs> In- In- Infernal hails to you, Hyper Shaman. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but uh, you got the first half of the episode, and I know that the uh, the first one is probably as exciting as you getting to cover a new Graveland record, so Black Metal Guy, take it away. What do we got? Definitely up there, but more in a kind of like sexually exciting way. Um, <laughs> so uh, this one is uh, Antediluvians, The Divine Punishment on Nuclear War Now. Uh, this is the return of a... Uh, this is the return of an entity that has been slumbering for about uh, seven or eight years, uh, more or less. And um, uh, I, their first record was huge for me. Um, this record is uh, just objectively huge. Next up is Conprise Bodhisandia. This is uh, out on non-self-supremacy. Uh, and this is a, uh, a Thai black metal band that we've mentioned on the show once before when it was uh, name-dropped by the dude from Sylvan Throne in an interview with him. Uh, and uh, I have I have the demo tape of this project, and it's been interesting to hear how it's developed. And now... Oh, okay. It, it's, it, it sounded like a, like a sentence fragment that was going somewhere. I don't, no, I think, I, think the thought, I think the thought decided it was complete. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So uh, next up, my side of the show, I've got two bands that we are revisiting from Terminus Past. Uh, one very early in the show and one a little bit more recent. Uh, first up, we have the new full length by Ruin with Spread Plague Death out on Goat Throne Records, Nameless Grave Records, and I think their own imprint for the cassettes. Uh, so, uh, Ruin, we covered a compilation of some of their split material last year. Uh, they've been, uh, a, a personal favorite of mine for a few years now, uh, playing a, an interesting sort of almost minimal spin on very ugly, very rhythmic doom death. And I figured, uh, with the new full length, let's see how these ideas stack up in kind of a complete album form. And uh, wrapping up the night, uh, I had threatened to cover it a while back, and now it's time. The return of Anal Stab Wound with Abstraction Bathes in Sunlight, out now on New Standard Elite. Uh, for those who don't remember, we covered Anal Stab Wound's The Visceral Sovereign, I believe it was February or March of this year. And... Uh, Extremely promising one-man brutal death project by Nikhil Talwalker. And, uh, well, you know, as soon as I heard the lead single from this EP, I knew we had to bring it on because as impressed as we were with the original full length, boys, you haven't heard nothing yet. All right, so we are back with the return of Antediluvian in The Divine Punishment out, of course, on Nuclear War Now. Um, so, this band may have, may have fallen off some people's radar and may, in some ways, not be on the radar for younger Terminators. Uh, that is because it would be, it's been eight years since the last full length, the Divine, or sorry, the last full length, which is, was called Logos. No, the title's in Greek, but, uh, it was, um... And that was 2013. Since then, the band was basically on hiatus. There have been a smattering of splits, uh, but I think that's all older material. Um, apparently, the drummer, Mars Sekmet, was in Austria or something at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, now I don't know how they've worked it out now, but they're playing together again. And uh, they have a third member now, uh, Aid Zugna, who uh, played under another name in Allfather. Uh, which was uh, a band kind of at the inception of this wave of sort of more disciplined, artistically ambitious Black Death stuff, uh, and um, also Canadian. 
So the, the first antediluvian record was in 2011, was uh, through the cervix of Hawa. They'd done a number of demos and stuff since that before then. Uh, but that was a really big record for me because at the time I was, you know, even more of the black metal guy that I am now. You know, I feel like I was, uh, you were very much like my, one of my key resources for death metal, right? And what did I like? I liked stuff like Morbid Angel. Mm -hmm. But, um, that was my, uh, Morbid Angel and Grave and stuff like, you know, just chunky Swedish stuff. So, and I, I liked, I think I was, I was already listening to some war metal stuff by then for sure. Uh, I already liked, like, um, Axis of Advance and Scythian and stuff, the stuff in the more kind of heroic side of the style. Um, but this was, like, really kind of difficult, uh, murky, in some ways technical or convoluted kind of death metal that really appealed to me. And uh, this is referring to... To this being through the cervix of Hawaii. I'm still yeah. waxing... I'm still... Uh, Still in flashback mode. Thank you. Um, <laughs> You're good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And uh, no, I, I I remember living in a very very small subdivided like a closet like room with a boom box that had the CD of Through the Cervix of Hawa on it. Um, um, and uh, it was remarkable. I mean, I think the Cliff's Notes version of how Antediluvian sounded back then would have been like the Virgin Portal, the Chad Antediluvian. Um, something like Portal, Portal Music, Portal was a remarkable band back then and interesting, but like Portal basically sounded like someone had hit rewind on a VHS of the world. Uh, <laughs> and like Antediluvian was more like really cool, sinister riffs played backwards or like written riffs, real riffs that sounded as if they were being played backwards or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they had these uh, long, wandering forms, uh, kind of uh, working, you know, there there was, yeah, I think, I think we'll, we'll it, it'll be, there, there's some riffing here that's reminiscent of the first record, but it was basically like, or highly riff oriented, but very centered on obscure riffing, kinds of riffs that were not like, riffs or melodies uh and the themes this band has always had a very uh clearly defined kind of spiritual or ideological center of gravity around um sort of left-hand path readings of the margins and dark crevices of the old testament and of and of you know uh ancient sort of levantine and mesopotamian mythology uh, so, you know, instead of, so instead of just being generically about like, oh, it's about like the Kabbalah and like evil Kabbalah or something, right? It, it's like about concrete stuff like the Nephilim, mm -hmm. you know, the, the giants of, you know, uh, the, the pre-flood giants and shit like that. There's a whole imaginative terrain that comes with it and a sense of kind of um, uh, opposition to the Abrahamic worldview framed from within exactly the cultural terrain that birthed it. Right. Um, yeah, it does, it does live in its own sort of creative universe. Yeah. It has the sort of, it, there's this whole nexus of ideas that are being attracted to this band in exactly the same way as like the sort of creative explosion around Norse black metal. Right. There's a kind of, there's a potentially not infinite, but there's a huge, there's a there's a there, well, in some ways infinite. There's a kind of clearly defined but infinite web of references that you could spin out just from the whole antediluvian vibe. In the same way, kind of that we've gotten so much from like the Norse black metal thing, um, and from in in terms of it having a vibe that connects to all these different levels of culture. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, very cool, very murky, um, uh, very difficult, and. Uh, Still, in some ways, war metal, and sort of physical, aggressive, uh, just stylistically oriented towards these kind of uh, death metal riffs played with black metal energy. Right. Um, this is a pretty. Uh, what's logos was supposed to be more straight ahead. At the time, I just didn't get to it. 
I skipped it, and I, so I haven't heard anything between Through the Cervix and this, but it sounds like the real, maybe, development has happened between the Divine, between Through the Cervix and the Divine Punishment. I've done the intro, what do you make of it? Um... <clears throat> Well, I mean, first things first, uh, just just looking at this record. So was was Anna Deluvian always this, like, weird horny? <laughs> Not, so yeah, this is definitely their, uh, you know, uh, bonk, go to horny jail uh, record. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yes, the... Uh, the horny police have arrived. <laughs> yes, in, yeah, sort of infernal, infernal Babylonian winged Shebas with their bats. Um, uh, but, yeah. but, but, um... They uh, they were not always this frankly sexual, but it always had a lot to do with yes, sex magic and like uh, I mean the first record has uh, it's called through the cervix of Hawa Hawa being I think a biblical name for Eve or something uh, mm -hmm. I cannot remember maybe it's another Mesopotamian goddess uh, we've got um, let's see I don't know from seraphic embrace sort of we've got uh, Gamora entity perversion reborn and erect reflection abyss of organic matter so it's kind of there um okay <laughs> yeah that i didn't really have a big point about that just this is an extremely like weird horny record well, so the song titles are fucking sick why don't you read them if you want <clears throat> oh let's see <clears throat> excuse me gentlemen obscene pornography manifests in the divine universal consciousness all along the sigils deep and eh, that's so great much title uh, how the Watchers granted the humans sex magic in the primordial Aeon, Guardians <laughs> of the Liminal, Tamasic Masturbation Ritual, Sadomaniacal Katabasis, Last Fuck of the Dying, Temple Prostitute, Circumcision Covenant, White Throne, The Liar's Path, and, to top it all off, Winged Ascent Unto the Twelve-Runed Solar Anus. So, it's a, it's a pretty horny record. But anyway, yeah, I like this. Uh, it's um, it's weird. Uh, I think for me, the back half of the record comes together a little bit better than the front half. I, and I think there's a pretty distinct division between the two. Uh, the first part of the record, as we'll get into, uh, is much more kind of improvisational and jammy sounding. And while there are excellent ideas and excellent passages throughout the whole first half, I do find myself missing some of the just intensely riffy quality that this band does have sometimes. But the back half fills in that void. And then there was certain stuff that happened on the back half of the record that kind of recontextualized the first half. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking if I put more listens into this, I'm going to like it more and more. Um, I will say that uh, this is definitely, this is interesting because, you know, I've heard through the cervix of Hawa and a little bit of other antediluvian stuff, but it's been a long time. Um, and it is sonically connected to a lot of things that I really like. But it's also... Antediluvian, more than a lot of the other sort of contemporary, for lack of a better word, arty war metal bands, mm -hmm. um, they've had a real arty streak to them beyond most of the pretenders. Like, you know, take a band like Portal... I'm not a big Portal fan. That being said, I think they're worthy of respect. I'll make fun of Portal, but obviously they're good at what they do. Portal successfully creates an atmosphere so sort of uh, so sort of like bleak and uh, disorienting that nobody wants to hang out there. <laughs> exactly. It's like it, it it is perfect at creating an atmosphere that I'm just not that interested in. Um, but the difference between Portal and this band is that Portal is uh, Portal feels a little bit more self-conscious. This feels like actual crazy people made this music. <laughs> um, this is very bizarre and very extreme, but not in the ways you're thinking necessarily. Uh, you know, because th this is not a band that dwells in crazy excesses of tempo or technicality or even individually extreme like noisy tones but the kind of music that they make 
uh, has this like unsettling outsider quality uh, that I think a lot of bands in this vein gesture towards, but rarely arrive at. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, I think this is probably yeah. So I think what you're saying about the way the album is structured uh, is that makes sense to me. I love the first half. But one reason it might make sense to me more is that I listened to through the cervix a lot. So mm-hmm. maybe there was more of just a context for like, okay, this is antediluvian doing a kind of uh, more free or open version of uh, stuff they've already done. Um, but it does seem like basically they did, it could have been that they literally like wrote the first half of the record and then decided to put that almost all of that should be the back end of the record. You know, like yeah. it's it's yeah, like that. that if if you if you restructured the songs, you could basically make it so that it was one of those things that had the tight, aggressive first half and then the more out there second half. But they just start there with they start with the out there second half. I I, I kind of mm. like the inversion, and I yeah. I think there is a track that is kind of the the skeleton key to this whole record. But I'll get to that a little bit later. We should probably play samples. <laughs> Fair <laughs> instead enough. Of waxing, instead of waxing uh, Lovecraftian poetic over it. Um, all right, so, first one. How the Watchers Granted the Human Sex Magic in the Primordial Aeon. Uh, this is the first track that really grabbed me in a big way. And this is where I started to understand, on the first half, how they're structuring these songs... And I think you'll have a lot to say about it, but um, let's listen to just the the opening right from the top of this track with the idea of, as we've described on the show, sound objects in your mind. So that's a that's a really interesting section of music, and it brings up a lot of a lot of contrasting ideas I have about this band with you. Uh, one is that I really read this as a drummer band, as we've talked about, because Mars, her performance on this record is really distinct and interesting, and has its own musical voice. Um, in that uh, extended sequence. Uh, where they're doing the the choral passage over that looping riff, Mm -hmm. Um, it's very hard to track because every time the riff comes around, they're doing it at a different time signature. 
Um, it's like it's like four four to six four to five four to seven four to like nine four. They keep dragging it out further and further. And her particular drumming style is it's interesting. It has this clattering quality as though she's dropping beats, sort of like you're listening to Battles in the North or something. But she's dropping exactly the same ones every time. So it's just these very these very custom written beats, which sounds like these had to have been developed in these extended jam sessions. It would be very hard to write this music directly without feeling it out in a live band environment. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I get what you mean about drummer band. I mean, this is always, I mean, her, her drumming style has always been at the center of the band or important to it. Uh, I think like in a strict sense for drummer band, we might use that to mean like a band that is either uh, where the riffing is either kind of boring and therefore it really centers, like deliberately boring to center things on the drumming. Like the riffing provides more of like a textural or her harmonic kind of sort of, sort of, it, yeah, it provides a sort of a continuous texture or something and the drums are really shaping that. Or on the other hand, like a band written by a drummer where like the guitar parts are super ADHD. Right, so like, or are just like designed to work with uh, rapidly changing percussion parts. So within this Canadian scene, rights of thy rights of thy de Gringolaid, yeah, right, something like that. Um, uh, or or Sunop for in France, what I say. Like, uh, um, either way, whether it's super busy or super like sparse, either way, it kind of foregrounds the drumming. This is definitely like I could see. Yeah, I think the drumming, the drums are the anchor of this music, uh, but I think there's so much cool shit going on in the guitars that end in like uh, that. You know, at least I find all that stuff really intrinsically interesting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, like, in terms of the, and yeah, we'll talk more about the improvisation thing. Uh, I think in terms of like the sound object thing. So what what would were you define here? May, are we on the same page about what the what the notable thing is? The sort of yeah, the, 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 the well, the combination of the choral piece and those like squalling leads, mm -hmm. and the squalling leads are used to introduce the choral sections. Um, it it kind of goes in with my idea that this this record, and you know, I don't know if you could apply this to the whole band, but mm -hmm. this record is not really riff based it's almost classical it's based off kind of movements you know these mm -hmm. these long segmented parts um that have very distinct beginnings and endings and are not designed to flow into each other in the same way that a metal record typically does well yeah i mean certainly all the points of the points of interest in a guitar could rarely be described as like regular riffs so like what I'm thinking is, like, an interesting thing about this record is that, you know, say, like, we've used that word sound object a lot to talk about, say, serpent column, where you have these moments of, where there's a sort of clanging, you know, a single clanging guitar chord that just reverberates for way longer than you'd expect it to. It has something kind of intrinsically satisfying about it. Or these kind of moments where the song might break in the middle and he just starts, like, bashing the guitar and scraping, you know, scraping along the strings in this sort of uh, singular way that doesn't repeat. Um, a cool thing about this record is that all these songs, these songs, pretty much every song has something like that in it, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of, um, uh, this thing that's something uh, above and beyond, that really stands out, that's above and beyond the general continuum of the riffing, that often depends on, like, uh, parts over the rhythm guitar. Uh, but like instead of these these remarkable moments kind of like interrupting the move music or like the riffing continues and there's like a some sort of cool synth pad thing happens over it and then just goes away like hanging over the music these feel like they're kind of like essential to the tissue of the song itself on a kind of uh you know like as part of the quote unquote melodies so like uh in that sample, you've got this, like, instead of just being some moment where we get the keyboards coming out in a swarm, right? It, it's part of, 
it works those 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 key, those sort of choral keys work as part of a looping structure that works with a riff um and so it's kind of like I, I feel like throughout this instead of just being objects these interesting sonic kind of events or actions like they sort of repeat they cycle sometimes they change internally they work along with the uh they form as they form part of the propulsive core of the music in a way that I think is pretty unique and cool. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I think that, uh, one thing that oddly it's extremely similar to is a, uh, a band that you'll reference, uh, when talking about your next sample. Ah, nice, uh, nice transition. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, also, I mean, also worth saying that that moment that you sampled there is, like, the first, like, catchy moment on the record. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, that is, you know, and also in the riffing there, you get some sort of concession to, like, 90s Scandinavian-style riffing, right? You know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, like, the that's the hook. Um, now we get to Guardians of the Liminal. Uh this is a, uh, in terms of the sort of uh, integral role of all these things that don't necessarily, you wouldn't expect as part of the core rhythm guitar and st guitar structure of a war metal song. Um, here's another big one. Uh, so whether it's sound object, sound event, sound sequence, uh, Sound sequence sounds kind of like you're a DJ, so maybe not that. Um, <laughs> sound process. Uh, but, like, so here, that thing, whatever it is, takes up most of the track, but it's not an interlude, uh, and it's thoroughly integrated with the metal stuff. You're going to hear metal before the sample, metal metal after it with or not before the sample you hear metal before this sound object part metal after it kind of interweaving with it at the end of the sample and the basic core of the antediluvian metal stuff continues under the sound object the whole time
<laughs> yeah, so here's a question for you, uh, sound guy. Um, are those, uh, at the very end, you, you've had these sort of, um, there've been this sort of gently whistling, gliding tones throughout. That sounds almost like whale song. Like, the only thing I compare it to are, like, whale sounds on Isis is Oceanic. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, they seem to be, at the end, those tones sort of collapse into the kind of, one of the kind of, like, backward-sounded, weebly-woobly kind of lead things at the end. And I think if you listen to the beginning of the sample, it sounds kind of like they come out of the continuum of guitar. Is that basically a more extreme version, that kind of, like, hyper-high glissando thing, like another version of the guitar what the guitar is doing when he's doing those sort of like bombing noise solos well i i think there's a few possible origins to the sounds themselves but actually listening to that again um uh, the band that it connected to me to uh, which also leads me into a certain direction as far as where i think that comes from is uh it reminded me a lot of the superion record that we covered a couple months back so I'm guessing that it might be from, like, a, a real analog synth. That would be awesome. Um, yeah. Superion probably. definitely, I mean, the name even gestures to revenge, right? So part of the same, also weirdly part of the same uh, family tree as this band. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think that uh, you've got, like, a certain set of patches, or honestly, it sounded really convincing. That might be an actual violin played over a lot of that. Oh no! I think um, there was an actual violin for sure. I'm wondering about the like the sweet, just the synth tones at the end. There was actual violin, but over the top there were all these like. I think that's an analog synth. Okay. Um, just based off the uh, both the actual sound mm -hmm. and the because analog synth tones don't blend with mm -hmm. metal usually, um, yeah. but usually in a cool way like they did on that Superion record. Um, uh, so I'm guessing that it comes from that, as well as just, like, the movements that it makes would be possible, but extremely difficult to do with regular digital production. So, yeah. yeah. So, like, um, what, so, like, this is, um, a lot of cool stuff about this. So, one, you said metal. That's an important thing. The metal doesn't, insofar as metal is, broadly speaking, what this record is, Right. The metal doesn't really stop during that entire part, mm -hmm. even though the mood totally shifts, and in some ways the stylistic DNA shifts. Uh, the all right, so the, the you keep getting that sort of like uh, free Tom Rolly kind of Mars segment drumming underneath, uh, and that sort of and it's not just like in a. Yeah, so, okay, I guess I should have said, like, the interesting stylistic shift that happens here is really it starts to just work exactly like a neo-folk or neo-classical kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you wanted to compare it to something, it'd be like Sol Invictus, but in some ways this is like, a, this is just, oh, well, sir, it's a lot livelier. Um, this is, uh, you, you get this sort of, you get the violin, which is uh, really well written. Um, you get the... Uh, you get this sort of arpeggiated kind of gothy guitar underneath um, and, you know, this sort of industrial key or sample sound effects, um, the analog synth. Um, and, you know, the mood is just sort of like uh, serene and reverent and right, beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but the percussion's working under that way in a way that, like, makes it move. Um yeah. It's not still like a a blast beat or a, or a Slayer beat, but some of the maybe not aggression, but it keeps momentum and drive throughout, and it keeps that kind of uh, improvisatory freedom underneath it. I wouldn't describe neo folk or post industrial as like it's maybe kind of improvising noise stuff, but the song frameworks are usually pretty rigid, and mm -hmm. if there are drums, the drums are usually of a more sort of. Uh, industrial framework or just kind of like a folky sounding drum kind of keeping the time boom 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 right uh this is just sort of um that rhythmic substructure of the track is just way more animated and rapid uh 
And in terms of the layering, like, if this were a regular kind of sound object thing, maybe it'd focus on one thing. But, like, we've got, like, the guitars, the violins, those, those, whatever those whale sounds are, right, uh, <laughs> are all striking and all integral to it. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, like, in terms of uh, pulling out of a standard Black Death format and um, really effectively incorporating stuff from uh, that post-industrial neck of the woods, it and sort of the mood even reminds me of some of the my favorite parts on the last Reverorum records. Yeah, as yeah, in Reverorum definitely, and Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely get that vibe. I I mm-hmm. think that. It would not surprise me if both of these bands were listening to each other, you know, as that far makes as sense. The, the kind of energy, the kind of, uh, the way they incorporate these elements external to metal, uh, you know, and there, there's even passages on, you know, this antediluvian record where you've got the blast beat and the squalling solo, but the the way the tones work is kind of like one of those Reverend Warren blast beat passages where they just... You know, you've got this horrible clattering machine gun blast beat and this indecipherable riff, but this glorious, like, you know, four, like, eight-note chord hanging over the whole thing. And, uh, you know, they're approaching it from different directions, but they're arriving at a very similar quality. Yeah, and so in terms of, like, uh, outside influences, that might also... This might be the place to address it, like... uh, what, like, so Antediluvian have clearly always been paying attention to other things, but this is a place where, like, undertone influences are coming to the surface. In terms of, like, the thorough thoroughness of drawing on jazz throughout, right? I can only think of Defeated Sanity mm-hmm. on, on in terms of that. Uh, and in somewhat different ways, right? Like, Defeated Sanity is very, those are, like, completely written out songs and they involve a lot of the sort of like discipline and technical chops of jazz as well as that kind of sense of play and openness this is like wild free jazz um yeah which merges with the best of the barbaric spirit in war metal and really helps just sort of um, find a new sp- new rhythmic space to explore in this type of music, which is often very locked in, even when the riffs are weird, right? Often very locked into bat 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 bat, right? For for better or worse. Um, uh, and parts of this, as we've said, seem totally improvised. There's some incredible soloing, uh, which is just sort of like structured often structured noise soloing but it's never separated off from the idea of a regular guitar solo mm-hmm. um so there are there's great soloing on the uh back end of uh all along the sigils deep um and it sort of blends in it's you know there's like making these sort of uh japanese noise core almost sort of like dive bomb bend scream sounds and then it blends it into more kind of Middle Eastern type stuff. Um, uh, but, um, but like, yeah, well, yeah, is it All in the Sigils Deep or is it, is it the, uh, oh no, is the set latter half of How the Watchers Granted the Human Sex Magic. Yeah, but, um, really cool solo type stuff, um, real improvisation, uh, and it's, this is, I think, as far as I've heard, we've been talking a lot this year about how, People can inject more uh, dynamism, openness, freedom into extreme metal playing. This is a very fully realized version of that. Yeah, Um, I can see that. So there's like real listening to jazz here and also like real listening to, uh, you know, yeah, to the post-industrial stuff, to goth. There's some straight up gothy guitars in various places here, including on that sample. Um uh, you know, like, yeah, actual Japanese noise core seems relevant, isn't usually incorporated, uh, Scandinavian black metal and black death stuff. Uh, and in terms of the meshing of things, aside from the jazz, it, it's also very similar to a lot of the different strands people are trying to draw on from the, in that scene we've been calling orthodox cavern, orthodox black metal meets cavern core kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I can see that. 
so after that, you know, there were a couple things. You know, I, I was going to sample one, but it feels like you guys can probably predict it. But getting into the back half of the record, um, there are some straight up banger tracks. Uh, you marked out, uh, you marked out Temple Prostitute, and I marked out Circumcision Covenant, uh, both of mm-hmm. which are very straightforward kind of rippers. And there's interesting stuff there, uh, just that I would note in passing. Uh, stuff like uh, how, you know, this is where they kind of prove their chops. We always talk w- with any kind of wildly experimental mm-hmm. metal band that you have to prove your chops. You have to prove that you can write the riffs from the bass genre to justify yeah, you yeah, going yeah. outside yeah, of it. That's right. And on the back half of this record, they do a lot of that. They prove themselves as accomplished kind of war metal riff writers. Um, and what's also very interesting is, uh, especially listening to the back half of this record, um, I feel like if you played some of this stuff maybe at, at, at you know time and a half speed, you would have something very akin in places to some of the really abstract brutal death that we like, like uh, Brodequin or Induced or just some of the, the really kind of fringy stuff that we've brought onto the show over the past year or so. Um, I think that's true. I mean, I think like uh, in Temple uh, Temple Prostitutes, there's a part that where they they whip whip through this kind of like parallel universe thrash part that sounds a lot like Concrete Winds, who we've also yeah, pointed yeah. out as very original sort of cutting edge war metal stuff. That clear. I mean, those guys clearly probably listen to Brutal Death. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I I think that the guys in Anadiluvian are listening to stuff from all over the map, and they're really mm-hmm. effective at incorporating everything. But uh, speaking of concrete winds, uh, you've got one off the last track. Oh yes. Uh, well, this is um, you know, yeah. So we were going to play one of those songs, but at terminus, our goal is to lead you beyond the path of easy pleasure. So here is. Wing descent onto the Twelver and Solar Anus. You know, listening to a lot of these samples again, I feel like I'm starting to get the uh, the linking idea to a lot of the riffing on this, which is it, a lot of the riffs are sort of like simple classical stem melodies. Uh, you know, the, the, the first five notes of a more elaborate kind of violin passage in maybe mm-hmm. a... Like a uh, like a Baroque classical piece, and what they also mm-hmm. remind me of, kind of connecting with the brutal death idea, is uh, cryptopsy. Uh, I I feel like there's a lot of sort of you know cryptopsy plays around with these sort of ornate neoclassical melodies, 
periodically. Mm -hmm. And this is like a very stripped down primitive version of some of those ideas you would hear on None So Vile. And, you know, given the Canadian origin, it wouldn't surprise me if that was that was an influence. Yeah, well, for sure. This, yeah, there's something very classical. I mean, in general, yes, that kind of ambition throughout this record suggests something classical. And yeah, I can see how. I mean, in terms of like stem melody, the classic examples, like the first five notes of like uh, uh, Hall of Mountain King. Four notes yeah. of, yeah, of, um, you know, what, what is it? Sorry, no, Beethoven's fifth. Oh first yeah, four notes of, of course. Well, fifth. The other one, um, yeah. <laughs> but well, well, but um, but yeah, that's the stem melody thing. Like five, you know, uh, four notes being moved around in this motivic way. But the in, in terms of the specific core like melodies here, yeah, it's the Hall of the Mountain King thing, and and so this is this track. You've talked before about like how now that black metal has moved in so many directions uh, beyond the original second wave sound, right? <laughs> It's um, it's almost now like se instead of being the instead of being like the obvious reference point for all black metal, the second wave Scandinavian style is now something that people can reflect on, comment on, or just like do a nod to here and there. Mm -hmm. Um, and this song, like, I mean that, just those are like those are fairly dissonant, but those are all written in. The, that riff sort of works in a sort of more kind of classically harmonically ordered way, like a lot of the Scandinavian stuff does. It has that kind of minor key dissonance. Yeah, it uh, works like a, it, it works like an old emperor riff. Yeah, exactly. It's very emperor. It's one of the only riffs on here you could describe as like minor key, aside from the big hook riff on uh, that on how the Watchers granted the human sex magic, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, and so it's like a nod to the Norse. I think that influence recurs in various ways throughout here. But on this track, it's like, okay, we're going to do our big, ambitious Norwegian black metal song. And the thing is, structurally, it works that way, too. Whereas a lot of the songs do have this kind of, okay, first half of the song is this part, series of things happening. Second half of the song is this part. Um, this has, like, a number of sections that kind of recur and interlock with each other. Uh, like that sort of gothy kind of ar weird arpeggiated bit at the end of the sample uh, precedes the beginning of the sample uh, mm -hmm. and returns. Um, and, you know, they, they bring back, they, they continue returning to this wandering kind of Norse melody and then they throw these chugs in, which are sick. So it kind of develops as it goes. Uh, and then finally they do the signature Norse black metal thing, which is the big riff Heard of the song, right? uh, which we are not going to get to, but uh, basically, song ends with a really sick riff, which I presume means we have uh, penetrated or been engulfed by the solar. Um, and uh, you know, nothing like a song with a big back end. Hey, it's Kari from The Poker Curse, and I'm Yaku. You're listening to Terminus. All right, and after attempting to record this lead-in several times and my brain malfunctioning each time, we are back with uh, Khan Prai's Bodhisandhya. So Khan Prai is a Thai one-man black metal project that uh, has come up before on this show, uh, mentioned by S Spellbearer from Sylvan Throne as, a, as an allied project. Uh, this is um, the first full-length, uh, or no, sorry, first second demo because everything is now both a full length and a demo it's a um, full length demo it's fine yes okay <laughs> yes see all right so and and the last one was also a full length demo um which i actually have in front of me uh and um yeah so it's number two last one came out last year this one came out this year just now uh and it is on uh his own label non-self supremacy uh so some of the visual signaling of this, of this sort of might suggest, uh, you know, sort of um, muted photos of sort of, uh, or, you know, the, the last one had this kind of like uh, black and pretty cool, like black and red, intricate black and red art of a Thai temple with, uh, looks like maybe some parade of prisoners or some torture or executions in front. Uh, 
This one is uh, this one is just you know a black and white photo. Sort of looks like a possibly ruined Buddhist temple uh, in the woods. Um, the artwork all kind of suggests uh, sort of uh, serious, you know, I- elite, elite raw black, maybe on go to war X, right? Uh, has the kind of um, culturally specific but non Western vibe. Uh, you might expect you're going to hear something that has. I don't know, a lot of Blaise Birth Hall influence, or you might think, uh, well, Thailand, that's kind of Vietnam, maybe like, this is like Fothana, that was maybe, uh, I copped to that on the last time I checked it out, and it did, and the last one sounded kind of more like both of those things, it had more smoothly flowing, kind of very sprawling, melodic, consonant melodic stuff, it's kind of in that tradition. This is pretty different. Yeah, I haven't heard the first demo, so how do you feel this contrasts to that one? Well, I mean, I'm only... I listened to it once through. Um, I've been meaning to go back to it for a long time. So, that's just first impression. I remember that it was sort of uh, more more sort of sweet, more mellifluous, and it had these long wandering structures, kind of like... More more like you'd expect from that sort of thing. Uh, This is... uh, it's like it has a harsher guitar tone, sort of an aggressive guitar tone, which we'll get into. Uh, the mood is considerably more tense, and, uh, well, it sounds a lot less like what is considered sort of uh, normative, cool, raw black stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you know, the dude's a friend of the show, I should have said up front, and... It sounds markedly different from the stuff I thought he was into most. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is, um, so wh- I think we both independently came to exactly the same conclusions about what this sounds like. Take it away, Death Metal Guy. Well, uh, yeah, Vothana, or the kind of, like, more sweet consonant black metal, this is not. I would say the BBH is still here, but a little yes. bit more subtle. Just in the way, way, way more songs- subtle. They, the songs kind of sprawl out in a sort of BBH manner, but I think it has less to do with the obvious touchstones like Forest or Branicald, and maybe more to do with deep cut stuff like Raven Dark. Um, but really, I guess the the spicy take for this record is this is to me basically a DSBM record. Yeah, you know, I I I, I think. Uh, now, we both talk to this guy pretty regularly. I don't know how into DSBM he is, but uh, this scans to me as a DSBM record, but not in the way a lot of people are probably thinking. Um, we've discussed on the show, because I am the, uh, in addition to being the death metal guy, I'm the DSBM guy. Um, <clears throat> uh, DSBM has taken a lot of forms over the years, and I think that what this really accesses is certain kinds of European DSBM from the 2000s. Um, there's certain tracks on here that absolutely bring stuff to mind, like Nyctalgia and Sturbend. Uh, there's stuff that reminds me a lot of uh, a little bit more obscure Danish stuff, like uh, Make a Change, Kill Yourself, or Blood Ulf. Um, but like I said, you know, if you're not a guy that's well-versed in DSBM, you know, you probably associate DSBM with, you know, uh, sad emo black metal, which uh, it, it definitely wasn't for a long stretch of time, probably for most of the style's existence. Uh, this exists in the kind of moodier, more introspective realms of DSBM. Before the style was kind of codified as, like, slow primitive beats, uh, you know, uh, sad arpeggios on guitar and random wailing. Like, uh, <laughs> before it got before it got codified around Nocturnal Depression, which Nocturnal Depression I like because they were the first people to do it, and then we didn't need that again. <laughs> and, but then cue a thousand other bands in that same style. Um, so uh, there's also a thing here which is, I, I think an attempt to kind of reincorporate some post-black technique into more properly black metal song structures. 
Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it lands, sometimes it doesn't, but I think the core of this music centered around these just, like, sad but absolutely capital B, capital M, black metal riffing ideas is very solid. Um, and I would like to hear this expanded upon and refined just a little bit because one of the things I like about this record is you know the fact that everything is not on the same emotional wavelength everything is not the same mood even within a single song um, but I think a little bit of tweaking a little bit of refinement and we'll have something really special yeah so um, I guess way to jump in would be the idea of post black on this record is uh or the parallel evolution with it or whatever is uh for the most part not what you'd think with one glaring exception which we'll get to uh um the kind of post black on here is post black only in the technical sense of the word um in that it is uh it's really accessing this school of sort of aggressive, sort of aggressive hardcore, post hardcore based European black metalish music. Uh, and you'll hear that really on uh, just right from the get go uh, Birth of the Nader. <laughs> So, uh, that is definitely not, uh, raw tape black. No, because there's an actual (laughs) black metal riff. (laughs) Well, yes, there's an actual black metal riff, and more than that, there's, uh, a body, there's body in the guitar tone, and there's, uh, aggression and heaviness. Um, and, uh, the thing it really sounds like is the first Viga Dude record, which is a favorite of both of ours. Uh. Oh, yeah. Viga Dude's um, great. Yeah, so We Good Dude, uh, Cliff's Notes, is an excellent Belgian band that shares at least one member with Amon Ra, and it is, uh, the first record was just this frantic kind of, uh, screamo mood, kind of screamo mood and occasionally melodic ideas via Slavic black metal, really high intensity, and the funny thing is as they've gone on, they've only become, they sound more like Gorgoroth now. Like they, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was about to say that Vega Dude, like, it's one of those bands where, like, you can pick up on this subtle, hardcore and emo undercurrent, but mm-hmm. you can just describe them as a black metal band, and that's completely fair, you know. Yeah, for sure. I'd say that that undertone is really only visible on the first. They basically just started as having a notable post-hardcore shading, and then just kind of went away. Like they they did the opposite of everyone else. Uh, they, they, yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, yeah. um, they became more metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so like, so something like Vega Dude, um, or uh, Terzage de Horde, who we haven't heard from in a long time, and aren't as good as Vega Dude, but are pretty cool. Uh, very h- high energy, sort of droning post hardcore ish black metal. Mono, it has a kind of monolithic low end sound at times. Um, but uh similar nexus of influences um 
And what those both have in common is kind of this sort of squalling. We use the word squalling to describe the solos on the antediluvian, uh, which is kind of true, but, or, yeah, that, I can see that, that being accurate. Here, though, there's like basically the core, when we use that word in music crit, it's like Cliff's hands for specific kinds of sounds often. Like the ref, the exact referent for that term is this kind of sound, where you've got that, uh, this guitar tone that sort of inorganic kind of abrasive uh emphasizes high end but still with some body in it um and it's being played in a way to emphasize the give and take in the guitar texture so you've got uh lots of these um lots of like half steps in the riffs that create this sort of anxious this sort of tense or anxious sound and these sort of a lot of bends that maximize that. So uh, this is like classic squalling post-hardcore black metal kind of thing. Um, and it has this, you know, sort of... Um, uh, and when I say anxious, not in a sort of neurotic or lame way, but in a sort of like high-tension, excited, kind of uh, maybe deeply concerned way um <laughs> high, high arousal in the science high arousal the yes fight or flight fight and or flight or you know on the first vega dude record it was just like killing yourself or something but um uh yeah th this is so this is a very kind of one version of the black metal storming thing and you know just the way it's structured like we just got this like relentless kind of droning blast centered around one tone and then boom double bass breakdown <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and then yeah. what happens after that? Blast beat again. Um, there's a bit of an opening in the middle of the track around three thirty, and then like just the drums drop out, and then it just starts the blast beat riff again, <laughs> which is exactly how both of those bands write songs. Vega Dude and Terzage. Um, yeah, I mean, if the technique uh, works the first time, it'll work the second and third. <laughs> yeah, ab ab I mean, absolutely. You know, like part of that style is these big show like sort of deliberately uh, sort of um, brutal songwriting gestures, like sort of deliberately dumb songwriting gestures that come off as extremely theatrical, right? Just like, let's stop the song and have it drop out and then play the big riff again. Um, well, yeah, that's, it's sophisticated hardcore and sophisticated just extreme metal. I mean, how many times did, uh, did Emperor use that same move? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um... So, yeah, so, like, basically it's, like, kind of, uh, yeah, part of this, this, the, the most aggressive parts of this record often come across as very much in line with this tradition of heavy European post-black, uh, or authentic European post-black, and that's broader than those specific, uh, low countries bands. I think Terzage, is Terzage, I think they're Dutch, but, uh, uh, they're, you know, uh, yeah, Netherlands, but, you know. So there's there's these fast blasty low countries bands we were just mentioning, but um, there are also these uh, you know like slow heavy crushing stuff that converges with French orthodox like Celeste, um, mm -hmm. and the back end of this track is much more slow, uh, kind of as a, a brutally trudging vibe, and it, yeah, very Celeste, also very Amon Ra, it like. I don't know if any of these are intentional influences here, but, like, that's what this sounds like. No, that's fair. And uh, I'm guessing that a lot of the things we're going to tie this... And also, like, I really like all those bands. Yeah. yeah. No, I, yeah. I think a lot of the things we're going to tie this to are probably not things that the guy behind this listens to a lot of. But I think, yeah. you know... He's a he's a listener of the show. He'll appreciate the weirdo parallels, you know. Yeah, he'll, we're, and, he'll find new things to listen to as a result. Yeah, and I think we say when we're trying to be clever, like show some sort of connection. But like, literally, like cold listen. That's what I would think this was. I would think this band was from like the Netherlands or France. Yeah, I could see. Or that. like, or like a city. Um, yeah. All right, DSBM. Let's do it. Uh. <laughs> Uh, Sakyamara. Uh, this is where we get into deep cut Danish DSBM territory. Uh, like I was saying, uh, make a change, kill yourself, or blot Um 
especially because there's a specific feature to the production on this demo, which is this very clear and very insistent bass tone, which is something you hear a lot in Blood Elves music. Um, so this is going to be the one that's going to be a little bit more traditionally DSBM, based on what a lot of listeners might imagine that to be. You know, you've got these these plodding drums, these kind of shimmering washes of guitar distortion. But then you've got this driving bass line, and you've got riff ideas that are much more sophisticated than you might be used to. And, uh, I don't know, this was, uh, this was a big standout. This reminds me also of, uh, uh, we covered them a few months ago, Thy Light. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it, it's rainy and introspective, but not self-pitying. So if this guy's not listening to Blotolv, that should be one of the first things he listens to. Because a lot of the same ideas are present on their like mid to late 2000s work. Uh, you've got these... One of the distinct things about Blotolv or Make a Change is that most of the DSBM bands, you know, you've got the, you've got the front half, the like... You've got that sober plotting half of the riff, and then you've got the brighter side on the back mm-hmm. end that makes you feel mm-hmm. sad. Well... Typically, the the regular DSBM bands just go a step up, you know. Uh, but the Danish bands they go two steps up, you know. They make it like a kind of a, a fuller harmony, um, which doesn't sound like a big difference. But when you've listened to a thousand random DSBM records like me, you start to identify these guitar techniques. Um, but I like that that's very sad and very like plodding and miserable. But it's not self-pitying. It has mm-hmm. none of the uh, the latent bad side of emo quality that a lot of DSBM does. And, as you also identified in the notes, what's really driving that more than anything is the bass line. Mm-hmm. You know, the bass line, it shifts, it expands, you know, maybe in a semi-improvisational way. It's, it's all in the same key, but it really opens up the musical space in a cool way. You know, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, the bass melody uh, really... Well, actually, I thought it was just the bass that evolved, but it's really the whole riff. By the yeah, end, yeah. the guitars are... At first, it's the bass doing some moving around um, as the guitars hold relatively stable chords. The bass becomes more and more active, but by the end, the guitars are doing much more of the typical sort of... Uh, French black metal flourishes, little turns and shifts that you would kind of expect and embellishing it. And it's really cool. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, um, it's a, it, it's these little... Like we always say, if you want to do something that is within a style, it's all about what you're doing around the edges. You know, it's mm. it, it's all about your own distinct flair. Um, and I think this guy has a very good sense of taking the skeletons of riff ideas we've mm-hmm. heard before and expanding on them in novel ways. Um, oh. oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, uh, I mean, you could finish what you were saying, but this is just... No, it's 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 still about exactly what you were talking about. So you were talking about that. That riff basically has... Um, uh, there's like four chords in it. There's the one sort of that we sit on for a long time. That's the darker chord. Rises one, and then in the neck motion to the next one, there's that big leap you were talking about. Yeah, I think yeah. the whole step leap. Yeah, so that to me sounds really mid '90s, uh, Jonas Renske, like 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 uh, Catatonia or uh, specifically October Tide. I know that that might be because I don't know DSBM as well, and those are just huge influences on DSBM. But like, there's a specific really sick part in an October Tide song that like that has that same kind of like, um, sort of uh it that that uh that momentary brightening in the riff oh yeah we we've talked on the show about how the the secret giant influence to most dsbm is catatonia yeah you know? and how catatonia is like secretly a black metal band also yeah exactly <laughs> but let's uh well let's get to our uh our moment where we both sample the same song yeah um so this is an example of a very sort of uh, dramatic song title that is sick. Um, this one, and kind of earned by the record, comes at the end. This one is uh, Like Angels Crying for the Sun. Uh, and the song opens with this kind of, uh, well, a blast a lot like the blast that opens the record. One of these kind of uh, aggressive post-black things where it centers on a drone and it's kind of here he's kind of slewing around the root note but not in this kind of formalist lame way because it's really about emphasizing that Yeah, and that's the, uh, actually it buried in that blast riff is the one gesture towards emo. Where the the second guitar is doing this sort of like sharp peaking chord fluctuation. This little... 
dun, 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 you know, in the middle of the riff, but, you know, it's it's kind of cloudy because of the rhythm guitar, you know, smearing across it. It's it's a cool little accent to the riff. Do you, you mean know, over the big epic riff? The, yeah. Is it's it just a, a, it's a, a little like passage. Da, 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 sort of in towards the last repetition of it? Yeah. Oh, see, I heard that as being a really Slavic thing to do. Um, I mean, that it can be that, too. Yeah, that sort of upper upper string harmonic stuff flying around. Uh, it's like... Um, but the place where those come together is later Drug. Mm-hmm. Um, which has came to me as a reference point on a number of places on this record. Uh, so this was the thing I was thinking. It's like... Um, yeah, the the end of Sakyamara also starts to get this big um after your sample of that sort of DSBM stuff, it starts to open out into this uh thing that's at once very DSBM or melancholy, but also kind of like massive brooding druid passage. Uh and this is that's kind of like later Druk Druk on they also see dreams about the spring or they often see dreams about the spring the last one which is and you know he's incorporated all this sort of post black stuff even kind of the French vibe in some of it um uh that seems like a reference here too and um big riff comes in in the middle right we think like Oh yes, you know, here is a man of culture who waits most of the album to bust out the big Franco Finnish epic riff, right? <laughs> but even though that that riff is a da, 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 even though that is written in what you call Sargeist minor, um it uh it doesn't sound Finnish at all. Um and and I feel like it sounds kind of if anything kind of like Franco Slavic. Um I feel like if there's an undertone, maybe a key to getting at this record in terms of things this guy would actually be listening to, as opposed to Post Black or DSBM, is it some some sort of idiosyncratic way of combining the French stuff that would go to make up, you know, the sort of mutilation legacy stuff um, that's mm-hmm. been important in a lot of the raw tape Black, but taken in a completely different way. And the Slavic stuff that's important to a lot of the ta- raw tape black, but taken in a completely different way. Say a way that emphasizes things like Drug more than, or weirder BBH more than the typical s- usual suspects. Um, and it's just just a, it's just a thought. But I think like there's some way that he's working with similar DNA to a lot of other people, but getting really different results out of it. Yeah, I think so. It, you know, we, we've talked to this guy enough, uh, you know, about various styles of metal. We know this guy draws from a pretty wide palette of ideas. You know, he has a lot of different interests um, within black metal and outside of it, of uh, just cool, melodic guitar music. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think there's a lot of very sophisticated guitar technique on this record mm-hmm. that uh, might not fully come out due to the production which you know I'll, I'll talk about a little bit at the end um but yeah I, I i think that what we're hearing is a guy with pretty sophisticated guitar knowledge reinterpreting these common kind of threads of this style of black metal in unique ways mm-hmm. um but also so let's go to basically the end of the record uh from later on in this song, like Angels Crying for the Sun. And this is where we get to the shit that I just love the most, because this sounds like Nyctalgia. Uh, and if you're not a, not a supporter on the show, you won't have heard us talk about Nyctalgia, which we did on a Terminus Prime episode a while back. Um, so it sounds like Nyctalgia, what it sounds more like is actually their side project, Sturbend which sounds very similar to Nyctalgia, but is different in kind of subtle and important ways. Um, But let's listen to how this record closes out, and uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more.
So yeah, I, I doubt that you've heard Sturbend, but basically imagine Nectalgia, but a little bit more tense, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a little bit more, like, you know, second wavy dissonant stuff. It, mm -hmm. it, it's the it's the anger and fear leading up to the suicide. Nectalgia is the acceptance of it, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, but I, I, I really love the way that that riff, I mean, that's pretty much a one riff sample but the way it loops, you know, there, there's these little accents on guitar that peek through, these little fluctuations in the bass playing that add depth, which was something also essential to Nectalgia and Sturbend. Um, I don't know, it's a, it's a really powerful way to end the record. And I think it shows the subtle stuff that this guy is really good at, you know, and which could be expanded upon even more to create, like some all-timer shit.
All right, after our interlude, we are back uh, now on the death metal side of the show. I think this is probably the first time in a while that we've actually had a clean black metal versus death metal split, although Antediluvian is not that clean, but, you know, whatever. Um, so now we've got Ruin with Spread Plague Death, uh, their new full-length record. Uh, this is the band's third full-length, I think, since their return from the depths in the early 90s. Um, and like I said, we covered... Uh, which one was it? Yeah, we covered uh, Plague Transmissions Volume 2 uh, last year on the show, uh, which was a compilation of, like, EP and split material. Uh, this is a band that does a lot of splits, a lot of little, like, one-off EPs, that kind of thing. And tends to compile everything for easy listening at the end of a cycle. Um, so, uh, Ruin is a band I've been following for a while, uh, since about uh, Plague Transmissions Volume 1, which was in 2017, early 2018. And uh, they're interesting. Uh, this is a, a death metal band from kind of the Inland Empire of uh, South California. Uh, originally, they were associated with L.A., but uh, I think they're coming a little bit further out east. Um and to describe them, uh, I mean, the easy way to say it is doom death, but uh, not in the sense that a lot of people are probably used to these days. You know, I think just saying doom death uh, associates this with, you know, a lot of like maggot stomp stuff or maybe just, you know, the old school autopsy and obituary worship we still see from time to time. But Ruin has a little bit of a different vibe. Um, I think the the closest thing I could describe them as would be, uh, and I think I said this on our last review of these guys, is uh, sort of a, an old school version of a band like Fluids. Uh, very minimal, very harsh, uh, doomy death metal influenced by, you know, Mortician, the usual suspects like Autopsy, the slowest material by Incantation, etc. Um, but I, they've, in recent years, they've really carved out a sound all their own. And this is an interesting band. They're kind of a, a hot commodity on Bandcamp, but not really that well known outside of kind of internet weirdos. Um... And uh, you listened to uh, the last comp, and you know you basically liked it. I would say mm -hmm. so. Uh, mm -hmm. wh what do you think of this? Uh, now that we're listening to a, a full length record, I guess similar. Basically, like it. I mean, I think. Um, you know, as I was listening through to this, uh, or I thought like remembering the first one. I think, like, I was thinking, you know, I really didn't like that that much. Or, like, it didn't leave much of an impression. Uh, and I, I listened to this one, and I was kind of feeling a similar thing. Which was, like, this is influenced by a bunch of stuff I like. Like, I obviously like Ripaculo, who you mentioned. Um, in the notes, at least. Uh, and I obviously like, uh, you know, a lot of stripped down punky old school death metal which this is a lot in common with uh you know i've never listened to that much autopsy but you tell me i like things that sound like autopsy um mm -hmm. uh <clears throat> but um uh so th so this has a kind of like a kind of like bashing minimalism which i really appreciate uh and 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 all that but for some reason it just doesn't like leaves me a little cold, which I don't think is really a problem for the band. I think it's more just, like, a little too death metal for the black metal guy or something. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, if And and I, tr I was trying to think, like, if there's some, you know, I was thinking, like, it's possible just if the themes were different, I would like it more. But... You know, like, maybe... Well, I don't know. If they put this out with some runes on it, maybe I'd be like, whoa, this is such a unique <laughs> original take on Pagan Black Metal. Um, just uh, throw some runes on that bitch. But, um, the... But... But, like, I was thinking 
if there's something on like a deeper level, I thought maybe it has to do with some of, something about the plane, which I think is maybe something I said about the last one too, where the songs have a lot of these hardcore rooted structures. Basically, depends on things like skank beat throws into blast, throws into slow part into skank beat, uh, hardcore minimalism in the riffing, uh, just you know, uh, just big three chord power chord riffs. Um, uh, but like maybe lacks some of the body music quality that I would expect because they're mm, playing okay. the they're deliberately playing them in this kind of um it might have to do with the certain specific tempos they're at but also mm. they're playing them in this kind of relaxed way sort of like so you get this kind of slapping or flapping thing in in it that I think is supposed to be this kind of loose kind of hanging rotting flesh vibe and it relates to the guitar tone because the guitar tone is clearly supposed to be the focus of this music and and so uh, I think it's maybe like making room for the guitar tone or something and sort of emphasizing the big massive quality of it um, and so like there are just times when I don't get like the thrown from one section to another vibe on here that said mm. Then I tried something that should have, you know, I, I, I did something um, that I probably should have done at the beginning. I turned it up really loud. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, oh, yeah, that's how this is supposed to sound. Um, and there was an interesting thing. Like, I don't know that that, I don't know that I'm totally hearing things in terms of what I was saying about the kind of rhythmic drive here or, you know, um, comparative lack thereof. But um, when I heard it again, I mean, it really just changed how... Tr this is one of those records where turning it up really loud really changes how it sounds. And I think, you know, this is maybe an error on my part because, again, I often... Uh, you know, the black metal bias is, if anything, to be dismissive of production one way or another um, and uh, listen to structure and texture and, like... But, you know, sometimes quantity changes quality. Right? Yeah, and I agree. Especially yeah. with music. Like, you just hear, you notice different things. That there are structural phenomena that don't exist at lower volumes. And mm -hmm. when you turn it up this loud, I almost... So here's a question for you. It's like, when I turn it up this loud, suddenly it, it drives harder in a lot of important ways. Uh it sounds like it, it rips more in many ways. And I'm wondering, like, is the point that the kind of, the way they're doing the drums is maybe spaced relative to the guitar somehow? I'm speaking very loosely here. I don't just mean leaving more space in the drum beats. There's just something going on where, like, the drums and bass are leaving room for this big, lumbering guitar tone. Uh... uh and at lower volumes, it's like the guitar isn't filling in the space that's been created for it. But at higher, vo like on a rhythmic or temporal, but on higher volumes, the guitar is sort of overspilling the sonic framework in the rhythm section. And you're starting to get more of that tension and push and pull and propulsion that you'd expect in more hardcore oriented death metal. Well, yeah, I, I've got a few theories about it. I mean, one is. I mean, that... I mean also just like it sounds like like the loud guitar the guitar tone is meant to sound loud and you hear a lot more shit when you turn it up yeah there's a lot more texture and shape mm -hmm, to the mm -hmm. guitar tone yes. when you crank it yes. up yes yeah 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 um, i i would say it's a couple things one uh i think we touched on this when we reviewed them last year is that ruin is an interesting band and in that it's uh, like this is directly from interviews with the band it's considered kind of an artistic collective and the producer for their music, it's always the same guy, is considered a part of the band. So mm -hmm. they consider the production and the sound quality and the sampling totally integral to the overall vibe of the music. Ah. Um, and that makes sense. It, and I think that that part, that sort of explains the, uh, the tremendous difference, you know, just when you turn it up. Additionally... Um, this was kind of a, a joke idea I had in my head when you were talking about the hardcore influence. It was like, so, you know, Ruin 
and a lot of, say, the D-beat and kind of crust bands that you like both have guitars that play a little bit behind the drum beat, right? Mm -hmm. But the difference between Rune and the D-beat bands is uh, the D-beat bands play behind the beat with their heads up. Ruin plays behind the beat with their heads down. They're not <laughs> e- they're not they're not excited about the next beat. That's you know? kind of what I meant. That is exactly yes, yes. kind of what I meant. <laughs> you know, it's like I remember a, it was um an interview with a I forget it was a I think a project one of the sludge projects that like Miko Aspa was affiliated with like AM or Flush Press. Uh, where they were talking about how one of the important things with sludge or like sludge doom stuff was the idea of playing your instruments like they have physical weight. Mm-hmm. Like every time you're every time you're playing a chord, you're lifting weights to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something you hear on this record. Everything feels like it takes like substantial physical effort to play, which kind of touches on the the miserable feeling of this music you know Mm -hmm. um well to get to that let's go to uh my first sample lots of short songs a couple of these samples are just going to be whole songs and this is one of those cases this is a track called murderous delirium um it's the third track on the record and uh most of this song is just one chord and they keep playing it over and over again in the same rhythm. Uh, but there's a lot of rhythmic change-ups underneath it. And I was surprised by how much mileage they get out of a single open chord. So that's a, it's an interesting juxtaposition this band draws between things that should be kind of like up-tempo and fun and just incredibly miserable, like winter-style misery, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's one of the things that appeals to me about this band is, you know, it's, they'll have these up-tempo kind of maybe grave-style D-beat passages but it it also just it feels terrible 
the whole time. You know, <laughs> this is uh, this is like a end of the house party room clearing music <laughs> in a real sense. Yeah, I get what you mean. That track definitely has the quality where it doesn't really like. Yeah, I'm. N- that track for sure has the uh, doing the fast part things, but not producing the normal effect thing that I was talking about. Yeah, I and I think that's uh, I think that's an inherent part of this band is these. Uh, you know, I feel like in bands like this where they do a lot of splits and EPs. You know, a, a lot of these songs are probably written, you know, just in a jam room, in a basement mm-hmm. somewhere. Um, and the you're just kind of stringing some riffs together. And the, the aggregate effect is something kind of extra nihilistic as a result. You know, it's, uh, it's, multi, it's a few horrible sounding riffs that are just connected in sort of arbitrary ways. There's no effort made to bridge ideas. You know, it's just it's just ugly and horrible. Yeah, this is more definitely more, that's definitely more up your alley. I, I I um I see that as that would connect to um it's related to what you like about the mortician blast riff. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> now I'm more I, I I like that style of uh sort of um randomness more maybe because it's a very sort of high energy kind of mm. uh arbitrary way of arbitrary playing whereas here the arbitrariness is kind of one of despair but yeah, as yeah. you've explained mortician kind of comes around to the same way it plays in a lot of ways the oh, mortician yeah. well, can be very like very desolate kind of empty music oh yeah yeah i've <laughs> in one of our infamous episodes i talk about that for a while um mm. but yeah no so mortician like you you actually read tabs of their tremolo riffs, and they're literally like four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one. Totally meaningless chromatic arrangements that are just there. Yeah, 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 the meow mix, the meow mix thing. That's why you have cats. Yeah, yeah, I got three kitties because they provide the desolate tunes that I need to get through the day. But yeah, so Ruin does a lot of the same stuff where it's like. Well, fuck it. Just do some chords. Just do, do some r- randomized half steps, and it sounds bad, you know. And it's, I, I, I there's a refreshing honesty to it for me, you know. <laughs> so just getting at the getting at the primal stuff of death metal. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that I, I think that is it. I think that might be one of those things where uh, you know we we've talked so many times about the difference between death and black metal and an idea that we've come to, at least in part, is the idea of death metal being at least very extreme kinds of death metal, which Ruin is, in a sense. Um, death metal just being matter, just mm-hmm. being a, a a sort of physical presence, and mm-hmm. the the individual melodic ideas aren't as important as the aggregate effect, and I think that song's a good example of that. Which is related to the focus on tone and the importance of turning it up. And it's like, if you like these guitar tones, this is, that's the center of the music. That's, yeah, we were talking about, I, I said in the notes that, like, to some degree, this is, for me, the equivalent of, like, a band for you, like, um... Uh, I think Eisenskur is the classic example of something like that. Yeah, that would be a good example. No, this is great. I really like this. This is really good and extremely true. And And I just don't get it at all. Yeah, you're like, look, this sounds like a lot of bands I like, and I can maybe tell that on some level it's good, but I don't get why you're so into this. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, similar kind of thing, where it's like, I like their way of playing and the, like, timber of the instruments. Like, uh, and, and like the, the, the tone and the guitar and stuff. And, and you're like, why would you make the guitar sound like that? Um, <laughs> and, and, or, you know, or like, or the tempo even, right? I think you've described the tempo to that band as something like, um, uh, trundling or something. Um, yeah, it's like, it, it's too slow to be fast and too fast to be slow. Yes, and I for me this hangs out in some sort of so for me ruin hangs out in some sort of I was often kind of in a tempo void, in in a similar way, uh, and like um, 
so I think they're pretty analogous in some sense. Very minimal things that are in some ways pretty artistically serious, but yeah, just like yeah. not landing in a certain way. Like extremely, like in some ways they're almost similar parts of the songs. Like, okay, here's yeah. the skank beat. Here's the, you know, here's the unusually slow skank beat. Um, but they're like total parallel universe things to each other. Like death metal guy, death metal guy music versus black metal, black metal guy music. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's go to Repulsive Universe Inside Nightmares. Here's one with some pep in its step. Um, and of <laughs> course, I picked the one that sounds Swedish. Um, So I think, like, highlight dramatic moment of that is the kind of staggered uh, falling down the stairs kind of breakdown in the middle. Like, John, 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, and that has a cool kind of extended time thing in one of them, or at least it ends, there's one phrase that sort of cuts off earlier or later than you'd expect, which is, I think they only do once, but it really adds to it. Um, Dude, you gotta listen to um, really old Mortician. Like uh, Mortal Massacre, House by the Cemetery, mm -hmm. like before the first full length. Because that is gonna be directly up your alley. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's more actual kind of metal, but it has mm -hmm. the same, like, harsh minimalism of hardcore. Dun, you know, dun, it's, dun, 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 dun. it does stuff kind of like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, old, really old mortician is what happens when Celtic Frost is taken to the worst possible conclusion. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like what happens a lot on this record. That's certainly true. Yeah, you can hear the frost in in that breakdown in particular. Uh, um. Another thing that that sounds like, that kind of tumbling quality in that breakdown, is Witch Christ, who I'm a huge fan of. I played it on the show before, and you were like, okay, this is basically just like down-tuned um, down -tuned Pro Fanatica. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, which and these are all bands. Right about. These are all bands kind of from the same scene who have been affiliated with each other. Like, there's. You can play like two degrees away from Mortician, and you get to Pro Fanatica. Uh, no, Will Raymer uh, played with Incantation for a while, so there you oh, go. Oh, word. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Okay, so so this is, um, so yeah, so I like this one. This this is just like, you know, it's riff, 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 and the riffs do kind of talk to each other here. Uh, more than that, the main riff, I just, like, I mean, you know, pick your simple death metal riff that you like, but I like it, um, probably because it sounds like In Love from Into the Grave, which... You know, I feel like Grave has become the... I've been referencing them a lot. I think because I'm... 
I think I've embraced your point about Sweet Death and Sunlight Studios. You were right all those years. However, I refuse to be grave shamed. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I do fucking love that record. And I think, I think they've sort of emerged as like a band that people understand correctly doesn't have that much in common with like Entombed or Dismember. Uh, I think I and think they're, a lot they're like of... relevant. They're like relevant to a whole slew of modern death metal styles that that quote unquote more developed sweet death is not. I think a lot of modern kind of old school death metal bands are listening to Grave more mm-hmm. um, and appreciating it for what it is and really trying to capture that essence and. Uh, God, that was one of the first couple bonus episodes we did mm-hmm, where we went mm-hmm. to uh, Into the Grave, my my first time actually listening to it all the way through. And while I still don't like it, I respect it for what it's doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just like... Well, a small victory for me. It's like, um, yeah. why aren't there fewer riffs, you know? <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, can we cut the number of riffs in half and then I'll have something I really enjoy a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um... No, I, I get where you're coming from. You know, it, I mean, really all we're doing is we're talking around this morass of old school, but like deliberately stripped down and primitive death metal influenced yeah, written by with hardcore ex- and grind. Extreme, that's true. Yeah, hardcore grind, extremely low resonant power chords one way or another. Graves' whole thing is how is anything that heavy moving that fast? This band's mm-hmm. thing is how is any fast part moving that slow? With such a heavy guitar tone. Um, Yeah, I I hear what you mean. There's this whole family of bands in different genres, quote-unquote, that are all kind of doing similar things. Definitely. And uh, you've got got another short one for us. Uh, Yeah, this one's called Ornaments of Flesh. Uh, uh, This is just a a short one, and here's um, another kind of ripper.
understand it. I get what you're saying. That that uh, that last beat uh, really is slower than it's supposed to be for the riff, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's supposed to be like thirty BPM higher than it is. <laughs> yeah, the ba dum da dum da 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 dum dum. Yeah, because that, that could just be yeah, like yeah. yeah, that could just be like a sophisticated crust riff or something. Yeah, or it could be like a big. Um, I mean, it's that same kind of like downbeat pattern that nobody uses enough. That taka 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 taka. That you know, you get in old slaughter songs or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but um, actually, they did one like that in the middle of uh, the antediluvian in that temple prostitute, which I loved. Um, yeah, but um, but yeah, exactly. That's. I mean, that one is definitely sort of. You could imagine it slower or faster. I think. Um, but um either way just not in this horrible middle space that exactly in. that's yeah 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 so um yeah that's supposed to be a headbanging riff and in there you could hear it's this heavy downbeat thing but you don't quite get the headbang right um i think that's one of the things i like so much about it though you know i know this, i know the, this, I, I think i get it <laughs> it's just this this it's incredibly it's weird because this is like kind of uncomfortable music to listen to, you know? Yeah, no, it's absolutely no fun. Yeah, it's it's no fun and it really has this like, it has a different kind of sinister and evil quality that's unique to death metal. Like death metal can't do certain kinds of black metal evil and vice mm-hmm. versa. Yeah, you know? That's for sure true. Yeah. And I think that's something that more people should appreciate, you know, especially as we've talked on the show about like black metal hegemony, black metal can't do certain kinds of really evil death metal stuff. This sounds but very I, just dead. Yeah, this sounds just like, like I said, it's, a, it's nihilistic, but in a different way. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, black metal nihilism is excited. You know? mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. like, this is just like awful and depraved and minimal and nothing um well speaking of which i'll just get to my sample slow degradation uh so something that you guys listening at home have heard is the sampling that is very important at the beginning of these songs and like i was saying earlier the producer uh, who I assume is the guy kind of assembling and attaching the samples on these songs is considered a full part of the band and I see why, because I think the sampling is really important to the overall vibe of this music. Um, as it is to Mortician, you know, anyone you see on a YouTube comment section saying, man, I wish I could listen to a, a Mortician album without all the horror movie samples, doesn't actually like Mortician. You can dismiss their opinions immediately. Um, there, There's something about the samples in Ruins music that are very important. I, you know, I, I likened it to something akin to being on a desert highway in New Mexico and you're flipping between stations and as you go from one to another to try and find some tunes to drive to, you land on something horrible. And I think uh, this is a really good example of that here on Slow Degradation. <laughs>
That's the Meow Mix song. Yeah, yeah, it really is Meow Mix. There it is. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's my question after listening to that, though. is like, you've got these two, like, slow, horrible mortician riffs Mm -hmm. that are awesome. I love them. Um, And you've got this horrible sampling at the beginning. Is there any reason we couldn't just remove the Meow Mix riff and just make it those two giant slow death metal riffs separated by some kind of horrible sample in the middle of the music and have something even better? The second one is catchy. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the intent to write riffs, they definitely know how to write a catchy death metal riff when they want to, right? It's a good example of, like, the total minimalism here is... uh, Or the refusal of death metal kicks, even, is pretty intentional. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is why I combine... Why combine them? Why I compared them so much to uh, Fluids when Mm -hmm, we talked mm -hmm. about them uh, last year. Um, Because I had a theory about this whole, like, southwestern ugly nihilist death metal thing emerging and i you know i gotta do some more study see if there's more guys doing that kind of thing but i mean maybe doing something like that uh with the song would make them more like fluids in a way but i think that i don't know maybe that's the move for these guys you know because the sort of riffs that they write and their sense of sampling is so sophisticated Like, let's just, yeah, let's just do that. Let's commit completely to this horrible, minimal, ugly, sort of, like, (laughs) blood-flecked style. You know, would we be losing anything if we made that transition? Hey, all! This is Brandon from Cromlech, and you're listening to Terminus! All right, wrapping us up for tonight. Anal stab wound with (sighs) abstraction bathes in sunlight. Very different from uh, the Visceral Sovereign that we uh, covered earlier this year. Um, So this is the solo project of Nikhil Talwakar, uh, who I did an interview with earlier this year. Um... Young guy, one-man project, incredible multi-instrumentalist. These are live drums not programmed on this EP, as well as the previous Um, full-length. We uh, we featured this on a news segment earlier this year, but honestly, this EP is so good, I just kind of had to cover it. Um, Yeah, what do you... What do you make of this? And now that you're a, a seasoned brutal death black metal guy, um, <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about this? As, especially contrasting with the uh, previous full length we covered. Uh, I I like this. Um, I think um, God, there's a lot more space in it. Um, this is uh, I think I would say it's more listenable than the first one like um this is there's breathing more breathing room in the songs uh the production isn't as brick walled which is good um the i mean there's a dramatic difference in the timing obviously because the first was an unusually long full length especially for brutal death so Mm -hmm. the fact going to an ep sort of inherently changes the feel but um you know, like, the first one I thought was good and had many exciting riff parts, and especially these really sort of promising, kind of beautiful ulcerating moments that we talked about. Yeah. Um, but definitely parts of the record were kind of a slog for me, even when I was like, yeah, this is heavy. Um, mm-hmm. It was sort of meant to be impenetrable, right? It was kind of like, here I am demonstrating my credentials as a brutal death guy. Uh, and putting... I, the My hypothesis about it was like, this was he had been sitting on a bunch of that shit for a while, right? It was like, here are all my songs. Um, uh, So it had this kind of dense, impenetrable thing where if that's what you came for, it'll probably be totally fine or even a plus, right? Uh, This is... um, 
you've pointed out that this record is jazzier. I think that's absolutely right. In that sense, it compares in an interesting way to the Antediluvian, where, again, the jazz on this is pretty thoroughgoing. Uh, I think... Um, as far as, like, big riffs... I think the other one is more big riff oriented. Um, okay. At least, but like, there's a lot of riffs I really like on. I, I, I it's also been a long time, so I don't know. Um, but there's a lot of riffs on here that I really like, uh, and I think I just think this one's better overall. Uh, a, a simple Agreed. way of a simple way of summing it up would be. Uh, It's, um, and I'll get to this with my sample, but he has very, very thoroughly integrated the sort of non-brutal death influences in a way that, to such a degree that they don't show, obviously, and that's what makes it so good. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, like you, I, I think this is just a categorical improvement in just about every way from yeah. the visceral sovereign um which was a very good record um and you have to imagine uh this guy uh, you know Nikhil he probably wrote this maybe like 6 months after the uh the visceral mm -hmm. sovereign something like that yeah, yeah. so the the level of improvement in terms of songwriting and craft is unbelievable um, well, I get the sense he was maybe already beyond what he was recording for Visceral Sovereign when he recorded it. Yeah, and I I can only assume that the next release by Anal Stab Wound is going to be even further beyond it. Um, so, for those who haven't been keeping up with everything we've been covering, Nikhil is a multi-instrumentalist, uh, you know, plays, you know, guitar, bass, drums all at an incredibly high level. And uh, we've covered a couple other records this year that featured Nikhil on it. Uh, the one that immediately comes to mind is the Undeciphered record mm -hmm. that uh, I believe he played drums on with Oscar Ortega, one of our brutal death mentors, basically. Mascots. Yeah, on, uh, on guitar. And uh, Paolo from Copper Mises on bass and vocals, I believe. Um, another phenomenal Brutal Death record. Um, and he's just making the circuit. He is playing in so many different projects right now, it's it, it's crazy. And uh, for those who don't know, Nikhil is, at the time of recording this, 16 years old. And he is beyond, you know, 98% of everyone else in the Brutal Death scene. So we can only imagine what he's going to have coming forward. But uh, let's uh, let's check out your first sample, and then we'll uh, we'll get a little bit more into it. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is just a very straightforward thing. There's actually not that much to say about it. It's just uh, here is a good breakdown, um, and uh, it's. Um, what interests me is that it's really structured like a modern hardcore breakdown, not a slam. Um, but where you would hear in hardcore, this would be done with this a lot of involves a lot of very rapid, close motion, fluid motion, uh, sliding motion. In hardcore, it'd be done with slides, basically, or at least with a lot of kind of like legato movement between power chords. Um, here he's using, uh, it's like he's, um, I don't know, like doing the digital simulation of a sine wave or something. Because <laughs> like he's following it in this cubist way with beat brutal death metal 16th note chug. So he's playing the chug so fast that he simulates a bend or a slide, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you. 
it fades out on a slam. Um, he just sets up a, se a section of like trading slams. There's a slam, and then there's a more melodic textured part, and then there's a slam again. Um, that more, the last thing there, that was a, uh, you didn't make a big, but that was a big riff. The, yeah. Um, that is really cool. Um, and works in a breakdowny way that is very different from Brutal Death. Um, usually, um, it's uh, rhythmically, it's like a thrash riff kind of. You know, the mm -hmm. it's got that hammer on thing, and with the hammer on and the general kind of like open note choice and whatever and the glistening tone it reminds me less of ulcerate or one of these there's another a brutal death band that you think is the more proximate reference point for some uh, of this stuff. yeah Disent doom okay so it's like sounds here like mastodon which was i was we were talking about in relation to that one indonesian band with the goblins being horrified perverted dexterity yes Perverted Dexterity had these parts that also sounded kind of like good era Mastodon riffs, like like Leviathan. Um, yeah, and, really, um, really using the pentatonic to its most extreme possibility. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like putting exactly. Yeah, really nimble pentatonic riffing that sounds kind of bluegrassy or something in the Mastodon context. It's meant to sound kind of like, you know, I don't know, dude playing banjo on a whaling ship or something, right? But mm -hmm. but here, you know. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's very. It has a thrashing, uh, sick heavy metal riff thing to it, or even a black. You, you can imagine Cobalt playing something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, you can. Well, it's a. I mean the the directions the guitar goes on this record are fucking crazy, as well as the the whole rhythmic dimension that we'll talk about a lot, but. Uh, to draw it more into focus and to compare it to some stuff we've talked about, you know, previously on the show, I wasn't originally going to do this. It's an EP. It's pretty short, but um, let's listen to Entrancing Visions. You know, we, we sampled this on a, uh, on a news segment uh, several episodes back, but uh, I think it's worth listening to again because I... I, I think that Nikhil released this because this is possibly the best song on the EP. Um, uh, but I have I, I have no complaints about playing it again, if you don't. <laughs> um, no, that's fine. I actually uh, almost... I, I thought if I had more time, I might have gone back and cut out my here are some cool breakdown sample and actually thrown this part in. So let's listen to it.
So yeah, the uh, the level of sophistication that this guy is bringing to his work is almost unmatched outside of like defeated sanity. Um, you know, you've got this this wonderful sort of like cryptopsy or uh, more directly like Lycathia flame uh, main riff that he keeps revisiting. And this is a thing that... Yeah, that, it's like a, an almost major key riff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's fascinating the way he delivers I mean, it. That really is like a... That's like the head melody on a jazz song, for sure. That's almost like a bebop phrase. Yeah, and he keeps major key, but with, it. It's a major with dissonant. Like, it's not minor. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it, it, it's fascinating, you know, the way he keeps playing with that idea, and that's something mm-hmm. that me and Nikhil discussed in our interview, the idea of doing these very motivic, very narrative kind of uh, songwriting ideas, you know, that everything is based off this head stem, that all the ideas yeah. around it elaborate from, um, and it's just, you know, the technique is... The technique is crazy. Sometimes in death metal, like in brutal death, the motivic thing can lead to this kind of like the last one we heard, where you were like, "Yeah, this is does literally sound like it's written in binary code." Right? Yeah, <laughs> like a lot of bands have some version of motivic writing, but often it's like what we've got is like a single four note phrase that's getting moved around up and down half steps and shit like that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh. Um, and is often four to eight uniform sixteenth notes or something. Um, yeah. Here it's motivic writing that is uh, fluid and dare I say it work. Yeah. And instead of creating uniformity throughout, like maybe like like that last band that you were talking about, the very binary sounding one. Oh, like Cerebral mo- Fusion. Yeah. Cerebral Fusion, right? The the motivic writing produces a uniformity to it. Uh, mm. Or homogeneity. And that's deliberate, right? Uh, here it just produces continuity. Um, yeah. And all these parts, re- like, you hear echoes of that main melody throughout. Um, and I was, I don't know why I said this one wasn't a big riff one. I think because it doesn't have... This album does not emphasize, like... I don't know. That last one had a lot of, like, almost Metallica-esque chug riffs in it. Um, yeah, I can see that. Like, like, And it had sort of, like, brutal big riffs in a certain way. Um, this album's full of big riffs, but they're all kind of understated. Um, uh, and they're all kind of talking to each other. They're not set off. Um... I don't know, yeah, that theme is really strong, though, and everything he does with it is really cool. Uh, it would be hard for me to describe what happens towards the end, but there's a series of breakdown-like phrases where, in a Brutal Death song, I keep... Th- it's always like, okay, here's the cool breakdown, and then there's going to be the one I don't care about next, right? you be like, mm-hmm. oh, here's the slam next, or, like, here's the sort of... Uh, here's the sort of, um, like... Uh, linking tissue riff or fiddle mm-hmm. that have, uh here every single one in that series of breakdown things at the end count like was landed for me as like yeah. a meaningful riff well actually before we uh before we started this recording session i was uh uh Nikhil actually did a uh, a playthrough of this song uh, mm-hmm. on his youtube channel and attached were the tabs uh, you mm-hmm. know, just on Songster. So I both watched him play it, you know, with uh, three guitars, <laughs> and uh, uh, also listened to the tabs, like the rhythm guitar tab in isolation. And what's fascinating is, if you listen to the rhythm guitar tab in isolation, it's almost musically incoherent. Like... The there is such a reliance on the interplay between two and sometimes three guitars to make sense of this music. Also, linking with some of the drum and bass ideas. You know, I I, I talking to Nikhil on that interview. He talked about you know the idea of 
things starting in kind of a, a conventional metal sense of, you know, writing riffs and linking them together. But I can't imagine him being able to write these songs without the whole idea fully realized from start to finish. You know, because there are so many ideas musically that depend upon each other to be coherent. It's 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 crazy. It's crazy to listen to this stuff fully realized, <laughs> knowing the root material. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I guess I've said my piece on, on that sample. So I guess we're going now to, I mean, I feel like this next one is the, the last track on the record is the culmination of this. And the themes here talk directly. I see why you think that, uh, Entrancing Visions is the best thing he's done. Mm -hmm. Because the themes on Birth of the Vermiform Colossus, a great title. Vermiform means worm formed. You probably already knew that because you're a death metal guy. But, um, <laughs> uh, um, hence Vermifuge being like something that deworms your dog or something. Um, uh, the, um, the, which might mean that Lucifuge is something that like delights your Danzig. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but entrancing visions or maybe D D lights Danzig's cats. Um, but, um, uh, birth. Okay. It's getting light. Uh, but birth of the vermiform Colossus kind of echoes, picks up that the intervals in that head theme and some of the rhythmic, the pulse in that on entrancing visions and just goes a lot of really cool places with it. And I feel like this one has, uh, whereas that one uses the sort of head or motif to like make this sort of uh frantic blast kind of passage um like high intensity blasting here that gets developed into like full fleshed melodic ideas uh and i think what i really appreciate about this track is um and the whole record but like encapsulated here i mean why i think this is the best song he's done so far is it's so direct um it's uh it, it, yeah, so I'll, you'll hear it, I think. Um, just keep in mind as you listen, like, like listen to the melodies, right? I don't mean the fruity melodic parts. Listen to the melodies and unfold. So um yeah, it gets all crazy there. Uh and you'll you'll pick it up at around around that spot. But um uh or exactly that spot. But yeah, so what's there to think about at the end of that sample that you've just heard? Well, uh he basically takes like the fundamental slayer turn. That coiling thing from Rain and Bl from any of the tracks on Rain and the Blood that um 
And he uses it to just make this, like, rolling chug riff that mutates in several ways as it goes. Um, that's, like, not, like, something you're, like, allowed to do. Like, that's not, <laughs> that, that's, or, or, or rather the opposite. That's not in the playbook in Brutal Death Metal or in Death Metal or in Thrash. It's just this kind of lateral move to a spot on the board nobody saw, right? Yeah. Uh, and there's no, like, kind of like with the Antediluvian, doing all sorts of shit that there's, like, no reason can't do, right? Or Concrete Winds was another great band like this. It's like, why not make just obscene, why not make these obscene sounds? Um, this is kind of, um, that, that's a thing that works on a visceral level, like a, you know, like an extreme thrash riff. Um it's more rhythmically involved, but it has fewer notes than a lot of them. <laughs> um, and uh, it's informed by a very visceral sense of like, sounds heavy and good. It's more nimble, maybe, than it's thrash, or certainly than it's death metal equivalent. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just really cool. He's using this sort of... Um, and he's as a way of changing it on the fly as it goes only at the service of metal ideas and so then let's go back to the original riff right the the idea of melody in this track you can hear how that like recaps how that's basically a longer different different riff slightly different uh it's an extended shape to it it's i mean i could like it's it's but it's based on the same stems as in Transient Visions. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. It's it's this weird mingling of major key and extremely chromatic ideas. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the sort of harmonic language is distinct. You know, the only thing I can really compare it to is newer Cryptopsy stuff, yeah. as well as probably some deep cut brutal death that he knows better than I do. So, okay, so, like, I've just listened to them both, right? And so the first one is, in Trans Editions, is like, and then the second verse is, um, that I can hold both of these riffs. I I'm, I'm, might be a note off on the second one, but, like, basically the second one really picks up on that stem in the same way. It just stretches it out from a little motif into a fully formed melodic idea. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, uh, it's remarkable for just how clear it is. If this is a brutal, these are riffs on a brutal death record that I can like hum and that like you could literally hear Miles Davis playing on his trumpet, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I, like literally I, these are like Miles Davis trumpet licks in like bitches brew or something. Um, I, I think if anything really connects to my very old initial thesis about modern brutal death, it's that. It's this record, the idea mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. brutal death metal as advanced jazz, advanced extreme jazz, and obviously the jazz touches are all over the place on this. I remember talking to Nikhil about how Defeated Sanity had become a primary influence for his music, and it it shows immediately on this record. I mean, the uh, the Sanguinary Impetus that we covered last year, uh, one of my favorite records of the year, Mm -hmm. I was thinking about this earlier today. You know, it was not only one of the best metal records of the year, it was one of the best jazz records of the year. You know, it, probably. I mean, not that you checked the jazz records, but as somebody who. <laughs> exactly. Be, yeah. As somebody who used to be guilty of playing jazz, I can tell you that's probably true. Yeah. And honestly, listening to the Sanguinary Impetus last Don't year. Don't worry, guys. I've forgotten everything. <laughs> But listening to that record last year, is there any reason, you know, if you're a serious jazz guy, in the same way that you're a serious metal guy, I, I feel like if you're a serious jazz guy, I could put that album in front of you, play it, and you would evaluate it as a jazz record. I mean, I obviously... I think the, that's the, probably true, also. Like, I know, like, yeah. jazz musicians, and that is probably how many of them would receive it. Uh, I mean, or many like, of them have the kind of objective comportment to music where you'd say, hey, this has a bunch of like weird screaming on it, but just like check it out. And they just hear like the notes. 
Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the timbre will be different. The the aggression will be extreme. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, you can read that as a jazz record in the same way you can as a brutal death record. And this is p- getting pretty close to that. You know, in, in terms of like a the wide musical appreciation possible for this. It's uh it's so sophisticated and so intelligent. Uh you know, I'm just I'm kind of amazed that more people outside of metal haven't picked up on this guy. You know, it's just mm-hmm. like it's I mean obviously the name Anal Stab Wound probably put some people off, but also know. he's he's pretty new. You know, I mean, hopefully he is, we yeah, can sort that's of help. I, I feel like I may try running this or defeat its sanity by a um, by someone I know who plays um, uh, plays jazz uh, and um, see see what see what he thinks. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's just I mean, I keep coming back to the idea that like in a genre known for these sort of just like webs of these just like webs and grids of 16th you know 16th note palm mutes or just these really complicated technical flourishes or just frantic tremolo or or the proverbial lattice work of slams um this is just such you can follow a line through this record there's like a there's like a melodic line moving through all of it uh and um it has such shape to it uh rather than say more I don't know, ideas of fragmented structure or, or whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's, that's really impressive to me. Like, and the, the, the cool thing about this last version is like in the first version of the riff on Entrancing Visions, you can hear kind of the influence of that kind of ulcerate stuff. Maybe not at all on the second. If anything, it's kind of a relaxed playing, and like the guitar tone on the second is just trem. It has a lot in common with like classic death, like the best, most original things. This has more in common with capital D, capital M death metal than with a lot of brutal death. Um, oh, yeah. Like that first, that main riff on this tr- song, like you could hear a riff a lot like that with the same kind of rolling double bass on a Morbid Angel record, right? Yeah, or a. Uh or sentenced, or mm-hmm. uh, even some of the cooler parts of death originally. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, just continuing off your sample, off uh, Birth of the Vermin, Vermiform Colossus, let's, uh, let's see where it goes from there. So uh, there you go. There's the uh, the real jazz at the end there. You know those uh, those like wonderfully dynamic little fills before the uh, 
the big down picked riff comes in at the end. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, like you mentioned in the notes that the way this guy incorporates the jazz elements, it, you know, it, it's not a matter of proving that he is more technical or more accomplished than anyone else. It really is used to drive the extremity of this music in a really cool way. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing there's nothing showy about either the jazz influence or the technicality in general of this. Um, it doesn't... I mean, whereas uh, the last one sounded like it had something to prove, not necessarily in the bad way, right, because it's the whole point. It's like where you prove something, right? Uh, you know, like the first Serpent Column record at times clearly has something to prove. Um, this record doesn't have anything to prove. 